Hi, and welcome to another No Fear Watercolor. I'm Alan Shuptrine from Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, and my wife Bonnie and I, Bonnie's behind the camera, she and I own a gallery in Chattanooga called Shuptrines. And I want you to know that I'm doing this live demo today in partnership with the Greenville Center for the Creative Arts in Greenville, South Carolina. I want to thank Greg Van Dyke and also Liz Rundorf-Smith for helping us get all this together. And also wanted to mention that I'll be doing a one and a half hour watercolor workshop coming up on May the 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if anyone is interested in that, uh, be sure to log on to their website for more information or you can also stay tuned to this Facebook page for updates. So, um, so today we're going to do a demo on uh, mountains and mist and as you can see outside uh, it's a beautiful day but a little bit overcast out in the distance and this is what inspires me to paint uh, from my studio. You can see what I'm looking at and that is my German <laughs> Shepherd out there trying to take a sun bath but it's really an overcast bath that he's taking. Uh, but that is Captain who uh, is my hiking buddy and many of you know that I, I did a book recently called I Come From a Place it's a book of my watercolors, and it's about the Appalachian Mountains, written by Jennifer Farr Davis. For more information on this, you can always go to my website, uh, alanshepturan.com. And, uh, but I want to thank the GCCA for this opportunity today to come and do this demo with you guys. And uh, let's get started. So, uh, so Bonnie is going to come over here and look over my shoulder with the camera. And I'm going to show you what I've been working on to, uh, to get set up for this today. I took a piece of tracing paper. A lot of times I plan my watercolors this way. I just simply take tracing paper and draw out the mountains that I'm gonna do. And then I'm able to take a pencil, rub a pencil on the back of that drawing and then transfer it onto my watercolor paper like this. So that's what I've done so far. And I don't think, oh, maybe on the camera, you can see the faint drawing of that, but I do want it very, very faint because I erase my pencil lines as I go. Um, or, or at the end of the thing. So, and so today what we're working on is we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, perspective. Now, the three kinds of perspective, and some of you that take lessons from me privately and also group lessons from me have heard me talk about the three kinds of perspective, but today we're going to talk about color perspective, not linear or atmospheric, but color. And as you can see with these little triangles of watercolor paper I've arranged, all four of these are the same size, but if I place the one that is the coolest temperature down and then place the next one that is a little bit warmer down in front of it, and then the next one and so forth, you can, you can quickly see how just by using color, we can establish the fact that uh, what is way off in the distance is oftentimes much cooler in color, and it is to the human eye as well. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, I made uh, up ahead of time, because I knew we'd be limited, we're going to try to hold this to just 20 minutes, I made ahead of time four different solutions of a beautiful greenish-purple color that can represent the mountains, and this being the most diluted of the four colors, and, and then uh, as we come to the next one, it's a little bit less diluted, and a little bit warmer, and then so forth, until we get to... Uh, the color up front. And to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, many artists refer to this as a fade when they're working on a landscape. And this is a little uh, watercolor landscape left over from one of my previous demos. And as you can see out here in the very background, this color is very, very cool. Uh, it has a lot more blue showing through, and plus it's a more diluted color. And then as you come forward toward the viewer, you get uh, colors that are more potent and warmer. So that's kind of what we want to work on today. And so as I'm creating this landscape that I'm going to work on, um, the first thing I do in all of my paintings is I get the background done first, and then I sort of sculpt the painting forward toward the viewer. So for that, I'm going to use a technique called wet in wet. And for that, uh, for the sky, looking out at, um, you know, the landscape that you saw just a minute ago out my window, it's kind of an overcast day. So I'm going to do an overcast sky. And for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some cobalt blue. Now today we have several colors out on the palette. I have cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, hooker's green, and yellow ochre. And then up here in quarantine, 
I have permanent rose and also sepia. And these two colors I keep up here on the side of the plate. This is just a 10 inch white dinner plate. And I keep the, these up on the side because they're very potent. And uh, if they get out on the dance floor, uh, they, can, they can do crazy things. I'm not really ready for them until I'm ready for them, if you know what I mean. I think the colors so, in quarantine are very lonely. <laughs> they are very lonely up here. <laughs> But I, I promise you, oh I, will, I will get to them. Okay, so for the background color for the sky, I'm going to take a little bit of cobalt blue. And you can see that's going to be a bluebird sky day if I just use that color by itself. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to dirty that up a little bit with a little bit of burnt sienna. Now, what size brush are you and, using? And uh, this is a, just a number 10 brush that I use for mixing. You can see how old it is. Even the paint has worn off the handle. But I'm going to take some burnt sienna and, uh, and mix that with the cobalt blue. And I'm going to get... Uh, uh, kind of a warm gray effect, you know, with this on the palette. See that warm gray look? Mm -hmm. Now, whenever you have to, uh, whenever, whenever you're making a sky especially, you want to go a couple of uh, notches a little bit more darker than you really want because watercolor paper fades, you know, causes the paint to fade just a little bit. Um, so if you ever notice, if you come back the next day, uh, things that dried or a lot lighter. So what I'm going to do is mist the background. This is a real fine mister. Well, wait a minute. Where did you get that? I bought this mister at uh, one of the big box stores. I can't really remember which one, but um, it's really like for hairspray or something, right? Yeah, uh, no, it's actually this one's uh, actually. For, it, I think some of them are made for plants. So what I'm going to do is right out here on my horizon line. Okay, I'm just going to blot that just a little bit, and I'm just working on the sky. Can you talk while you're doing that? Absolutely. Okay, what, so, um, are you still using that size brush? I am, I'm using the same mixing brush. Uh oh hold on. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, take this real dark color and I'm gonna drag it across the very, very top of the, of the painting because this is gonna be my ceiling color. And then I'm gonna go over here to my water and dilute the pigment that's in my brush. I'm gonna dab that on a paper towel. Then I'm gonna go back and drag that back and forth across the top and make that a nice smooth gradient of color down to the horizon line. Where do you get your paints? Um, I actually use uh, Windsor Newton uh, Artist Watercolor pigments and uh, I get my paints from any of the big box stores online. Uh, sometimes I like to go in an art store but um, depending on where you live you may not have uh, a very large selection where you live so you might have to search on the internet to find what you want. And as you can see, um, I've got a, a really good looking sky here and I'm getting ready to work on the first mountain. So there's a nice gradient of sky. Okay, can you see that? Yep, I okay. see. Okay, okay. And what I'm gonna do is right here on the horizon, I am going to just go up here to my, you said, well, these look like lonely colors. I'm gonna go up here to my pink. I'm gonna get just a little bit of permanent rose and I'm going to put just a just a tiny little bit of pink on the horizon line right where my mountains are going to be. I don't know if you can see that or not. I can see it. But yeah. uh, there we go. So I'm just going to add just a little bit of pink into my sky and then I'm ready to start my very very first farthest mountain and all of this is still wet. So I'm going to go up here and get my first mountain color that I was showing you and um, this is already diluted to the strength that I want, but it's also um, uh, has the, the, the right amount of purple in it. Is that all of these uh, Exactly, okay. exactly. When you mix all of these colors together, mm -hmm. you get this. You get a very, very dark, dark, almost like a, a pine green. Okay. Um, but, uh, but you also want to add some purple in those mountains that are gonna be the mo really, really distant mountains. And as you can see, as I'm painting this in, I'm painting it on a very, very wet surface. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fade that color down into the valley because we're gonna pretend that the, down in the valley we have a lot of mist and fog. So basically all that is is pigment that is basically what we call in the watercolor world a gradient wash. So that is my farthest most distant mountain and I use the most water that I will probably ever use uh, next to the sky uh, for that particular layer. 
So that is, uh, we've already finished that distant mountain. Now what we would do is hit this with a hair dryer just for a second. Okay. And I'm not going to bore you with this too long. That's good. And what I'm going to do now, taking that same brush, I'm going to go into my second gradient color, which is this next one. But before I do, I'm going to make sure that the border where my next mountain meets the previous mountain is slightly damp. So I'm just going to take a little piece of paper towel and blot through there because I want it kind of a satin effect, just slightly damp. You know, as we get closer and closer toward the viewer, I'm going to be using less and less water. That way I get a harder edge and I can develop the fact or communicate to the fact to the viewer that there's distance there. We as humans relate things that are out of focus and things that are more clear in focus with a lot with distance. And I teach this to my students. I teach the fact that you can communicate distance with three different ways in painting. One is temperature of the color. Another is the focus. And then the third thing, the most obvious, is uh, the size of an object relative to its surrounding. Can you introduce Rochelle? Because she's on here. Oh, absolutely. Um, my National Gallery Manager, Rochelle Haddock, is on here in case anyone has any questions. And as you can see, what I'm doing is I'm just sort of fading that color again, just like the first one, into down into the valley uh, behind it. And uh, I'm blotting this out with a little bit of paper towel so that I can give the effect that we have uh, some fog in that valley. Now you can see how this dried here, that's okay because that's gonna be, I'm gonna be overlapping that with my next mountain. And see how I have all these wonderful little upshoots of color right here. They almost look like distant trees going into the previous mountain, which is much cooler in tone. So I'm just gonna blot those a tiny bit because I don't want them to go completely crazy, but I do love those upshoots right there. So now I'm gonna get the next color in the, in the gradient. This is a little bit more potent and also, you know, less water. More and blue? yeah, you can see it has some blue in the bottom, but I want to stir that up because I want the I want that true color of what I mixed up prior. And again, just as I did before, I need to dry it a little bit with a hair dryer. Okay. So mind you, give me about 10 seconds. Okay, now some of you might be saying, well, now why is he drying it and then wetting it again? Well, the reason I'm doing that is I'm trying to prevent something called blooming. And blooming is where uh, you get actually a, a reversal of, uh, of what you've previously laid down. And that's not good unless you're actually going for that. Again, um, using a little bit drier piece of paper this time. I do want it damp. I'm going to take this color now, and notice the notice the the action of my brush this time. I'm going to actually push this brush uh, into the into that other color, and what that's going to do is that's going to give me a kind of a jagged edge, and give me the um, that's going to give me the illusion, if you will, of distant the texture of distant trees. And I don't really want this to chase up into that too much, so I'm going to just blot it back a little bit. It'll keep coming. And, and then I'm going to bring this on down, and that's going to leave that little pocket of fog right in there. See so that's that? not white. That is the paper. That's paper. Yeah, you okay. don't get any white in watercolor. And um, you know, even some of the most astute collectors of, of art don't really know that. But once they appreciate that, then they know that to be a watercolor artist, you have to be very much a planner. You have to plan where your brush strokes are gonna be from the very, very beginning. Now, I'm just putting in a little bit of texture here as this dries. Um, I don't really wanna go over my pencil area, but I do want to put this in with a textural effect because I think on this third mountain coming toward the viewer, you would see just a little bit of the suggestion of trees in the forest. So I will put those in next, and I'll just leave just a tiny little bit of fog area right there because later on I know that I'm going to be using this area for an area of drama. 
And that area of drama is I'm going to be putting my lightest light right next to my darkest dark. So now I'm just sort of blotting back a little bit and creating fog at the base of that mountain. And I will just take my brush, get a little bit of water over here, and now come in and sort of soften that little line right there. But I know that my next mountain is going to overlap that. So not super, super concerned with that at all. Okay, let's go get the next potency. That looks beautiful. And this one is really potent, but not quite as potent as that large plate that I showed you. But this has, again, less water, uh, more green and warmer colors. Now, some of you may be worried about this over here. Um, that actually is something that I'm going to deal with in just a minute. So don't, don't worry. Well, why would we worry? <laughs> well, don't worry. That's, that's the whole thing. This is no fear watercolor. We're, not, we're never going to worry. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to wet this okay. and um and i'm i am purposely going to work with wet and wet here and the reason i'm going to do this is because i'm going to let the fog on this nose of the mountain creep over into the other one and you'll kind of see what i'm talking about in just a second so again using the same uh sort of stabbing brush stroke this time though being a little bit more aggressive with it because i want a larger brush stroke so i'm going to use more pressure and really bend my brush down I want to use much, much larger stroke here. So getting some much darker pigment here. This is going to sort of fade out. And then that is, that is as much as that one goes because it sort of dives into that first mountain, and this is fog behind it. Mm -hmm. So I'm now going to soften that and blot that out. And you're going to see, now when you blot, you know, make sure that you don't just do it in regimented uh you know, areas, make sure that you sort of start thinking about sort of a, like a cumulus cloud uh, because uh, otherwise you'll get these regimented spots of color that don't really look realistic. Here is where I'm going to actually paint the uh, suggestion of some trees in here, but you'll see how the next layer is going to cover over that. Mm. Okay, so this mountain over here is mostly fog. And I've, I've left this little area here. You're going to see why in just a second. I'm going to make a real, real hard and potent line of trees actually go up and meet to that one. And that's going to push this mountain further back because you're going to get a harder line on that mountain. So let's do that. Let's go now. And I'm going to get go back to the very, very beginning color. And that is this one. This is the color mixture that birthed everything else. And it's very potent. And that is? And this is a, a mixture there. of cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, hooker's green, ochre yellow, and a little bit of sepia. And um, the sepia is, is really in this mixture, and you'll see here in, in a second. Now for this, I'm going to use a smaller brush because I need a little bit more detail. But again, I want a little bit of soft line. So I'm going to hold my hand mm. to protect the overspray from actually hitting what I've previously worked on. And I'm now going to go in with a smaller brush. Now this is not by any means a, uh, a pointed brush. I mean, you could use a pointed brush if you want. But I'm gonna to try to suggest to the viewer that everything here is still way off in the distance. But using this very, very powerful color here, I'm gonna create a, a stand of trees that is a lot sharper and, uh, and you'll be able to see now that what I'm doing is I'm creating a great bit of distance between my closest mountain range here and the next one behind it. And so all of this is gonna be very, very dark and we're gonna have lots of texture in here. And that's a little bit thick right there over the top of the tree. So I'm gonna thin that with a little bit of water and just kind of cut into that a little bit and give that a little bit more texture at the very top. So this will all end up looking like a stand of trees, as you can see. Mm -hmm. And I will bring this mountain range on up there and it's gonna go over this area and then it's gonna go up there and I'm gonna cut it into that shape there. I'll keep going, you've so, got 10 more minutes okay, let's which do is, it. of teaching time. I'm actually gonna start way over here on this side where it's drier. Okay. And I'm gonna start bringing in that texture. And you can see here where I'm leaving chunks of white purposefully. And a lot of, a lot of uh, don't, don't do it in a regiment, regimented uh, 
fashion, make sure that you stagger these, just like trees are actually staggered on a mountain range. Can you go real slow on one of those trees? Absolutely. Okay, uh, let me get gonna... a real pointed brush. What I'm gonna do is take my brush and drag it across here, and I'm gonna form kind of a chisel tip. I'm gonna turn the chisel tip on its, on its bias here, and I'm gonna drag it down like that's the top of a tree. And I'm gonna turn it this way, that way, this way, that way, and get the top, let it look like it's actually painting the top of a, hmm. of a dark evergreen. And this wonderful contrast between dark and light is gonna give me the drama that I need. Now, some of you may be saying, well, what about those huge chunks of white that you're leaving? What's so going on there? So go real slow. So what I'm gonna do with the chunks of white is I'm gonna take just clean water and try to focus my eye on just the areas of white. I'm only gonna paint those areas of white in. What I'm gonna end up getting is a lighter version of my color because this the putting water inside these little open areas is gonna cause the pools of color to collide. Oh. See? And then I end up getting this wonderful tree texture. Just kind of something that I picked up along the way that I'm glad to share with others. Hmm. You know, I believe in something called the artisan's code. And what that is, is this. If you know a secret or a technique, the very worst thing that you could do would be to take that to your grave. Um, like a recipe. You yeah, you really need to pass it on to others. And so this is why I love teaching. I love teaching what I do. I love, you know, very, very passionate about painting. Now, also, notice how I'm, as I'm coming toward the viewer, I'm going to want some larger brush strokes because I'm going to want the viewer to see that you know, as we come down the mountain, these trees are coming, you know, they're much, much larger. So I need a, a you know, a bigger brush stroke. I don't want all of these marks to be the same, but I need these bigger brush strokes here and there to show that these trees are closer. Mm. So, and then I'm going to bring this, now I have to connect it down mm -hmm. here to this, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, again, make my chisel point. And uh, what I'm, number is that? This is a number six, but it's a very, very old brush, okay. And it's very ragged, uh, but I like the way that it, I like the way that it holds a ton of paint. Uh, this actually was a uh, Rosemary and Company brush back in its day, but now it's just really, really beat up. And I think that Rosemary would be absolutely uh, horrified if she saw what I do to these brushes. <laughs> But um, yeah, I'm, I, I practice a technique called dry brush, which we'll get to if we have enough time, but that could be an, a lesson in itself. And again, uh, now taking this mountain range and kind of bringing it toward the viewer, mm -hmm. leaving chunks of white, uh, and then making sure that as you get toward the viewer at this particular point that uh, the strokes up front are much larger. So now let's go deal with all that white. I'm gonna take water now and really clean my brush and just just make yourself look for the white areas okay that's all you really want to look at is just the white area paint paint in that white area and let these little islands of color collide and you'll end up getting something that looks a little leopard spotty but that's okay there's a technique that that i'll do right after this where i'll go in and actually fill in some of these areas with the tops of other trees Five and, minutes. and you'll see how it's going Okay, I've been told that we have five minutes, so if anybody has any questions, fire them away. And if I can't answer them, I know that Rochelle Haddock will on the other end. So um, I'm really looking forward to this upcoming workshop that I'm going to be doing on May the 19th. And also uh, in the works, we are looking at possibly doing, doing an in-person workshop again, like I did before uh, in Greenville. And I hope that uh, I hope that that's going to come about. I, I think that's little... in July. Actually. Oh, it's actually in July. Okay, great. Maybe Rochelle can post it. Okay, but you can see now that this gradient of color. Now, see see what happened back here. I love that this little area right here because this is where the fog kind of came around the corner on mm -hmm. this one mountain. So, and that's uh, what some people would say. You know, referring back to Bob Ross as a happy little accident. Uh, love it when those happen. All right, so here we go. That looks great. So, and then this, now right in here, this would be very, very dark. 
So, you know, the, the uh, actual islands of color could be less, and I can go back over the top of it and dry brush it. So let me just finish those little areas because, and I haven't really established where the light source would be, but this is a great, this is a great dramatic feature here because we have our darkest dark right next to our lightest light. Awesome. And so that's really what you want to look for. Now, going back just really quickly, I can go back with some potent color and I can put it in between those areas and fill in those larger areas so that it doesn't look too, too leopard spotty as we had it before. And then when this dries, we will have this beautiful textured mountain. So Okay. Well, that's awesome. And what a beautiful day. Here you go. Thank you guys so much for letting me come into your living rooms or your studios, wherever you may be. Uh, this has been another No Fear Watercolor. I want to thank the GCCA, and I want to thank Bonnie for uh, holding the camera. And until next time, thank you so much, and have a wonderful day.